We're up in Sebastopol today because the West County Museum put on this exhibition about the hippie communes here, Morning Star Ranch, Wheeler Ranch, you know, where people were getting back to nature, getting away from the hate ashbury and the craziness of the city. They were still hippies, but they wanted to try something different. Anyway, you know the whole story. This is the hippie reunion tonight. A bunch of these people were there, and we're going to talk to Ramon Sender, who just put out his book, Home Free Home, about the communes. So let's go talk. So, Aaron, you curated this exhibition at the West County Museum here in Sebastopol, putting all kinds of things on display from the hippie commune era and uh, right Wheeler Ranch and Morning Star. And yes. Yes. How'd that go? How, well, it went beautifully. Yeah. There were between November and August, the end of August, there were 2,500 about 2,500 visitors to the museum, and it broke all the records at the museum. It was the most, most popular exhibit. But, but how could you lose, you know, with something? Here, it's the, 50, the uh, Summer of Love, the uh, 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love, and <clears throat> I had all this wonderful material from my stepbrother, Ramon Sender. Mm -hmm. So it had to be. And so it was a lot of work, but it was a joy. Uh, what about you and your history and your experience with, with the, the communes? The I whole had thing? no experience. Yeah, well, when were you even introduced to this then? Well, it was through Ramon. Through Ramon, yeah. Yeah, and I, I was born in Manhattan. I grew up there. At 30, I moved to Southern California and uh, had two children and raised them there and then moved up here, moved up north, and really got to know Ramon, whom I didn't know very well because our, our um, lifestyles were so different. Okay. And, <clears throat> and uh, discovered that he had all this information about the Morning Star and Wheelers. And the more I read about the philosophy and learned about it and what happened, uh, I've always been a frustrated nudist. Oh, okay. uh, never had a chance. Never had a chance to, to express yourself. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and now, uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's the, I. I was I was a debutante in New York, and I lived on Fifth Avenue, and <laughs> we shared a, a mother, uh, his, the the American woman who raised him from the age of two or three, became my stepmother when my father married her. And she was wonderful, wonderful. Of all the things you learned about the lifestyle, the communes, what impressed you the most? What made you wish you had been there? <laughs> it was the uh, rebelling against consumerism and conformity. and. I had been living a life of consumerism and conformity, and that these young people, well, I was the same age, uh, would live on the land uh, with respect for the land, without electricity, without modern conveniences. Uh, I, I was a wanted to, I'm a wanted to be hippie. Yeah, you're a wish you were a hippie. <laughs> yeah, yes, right. <laughs> Interesting. I love the way that you you felt that shift in yourself. Like, ooh, I should have been. What, what was I doing? That the epiphany of what was? What am I doing? The consumerism, the needless, all of it, the trappings of of our culture and our society. Right. Why we work so hard so we can get those things and then neglect the price that is actually at play in those things. The cost, the, the toll cost. on the planet, on the yes. people who produce them. Yes. Right on yes. our our own heart for. Yes participating in that, and yes. perpetuating that. Yes. Unfortunately, the powers that be in, or the powers that were in Sonoma County found that lifestyle too threatening. Okay. <clears throat> and so the county uh, came in and 
and uh, gave uh, Lou Gottlieb uh, all kinds of, of arrests and warrants and orders and caused him thousands of dollars in fines. Uh, and then the county brought in their bulldozers and destroyed the, uh, the uh, huts, the tents, the teepees, whatever the hippies could build without modern, modern tools. Uh, and then sent Lou Gottlieb the bill for the bulldozers. <laughs> what were they so threatened by, afraid of? Well, the, uh, the hippies, of course, some of them didn't want to wear clothes, which I sympathize with. Uh, after all, why should one? Um, and the uh, neighbors thought that, uh, it, that their children might be led astray. And also, there were some drugs, mostly LSD and pot. How was that a threat, do you suppose, to, to the powers that be, to the system? Because they, they were so straight. And, and they had no, the, the hippies had no respect for, um, for the standards. In the, as an outcome from the 50s, which of course were as straight as you could get, and so by the early 60s, uh, this movement started it. It kind of had to happen. And it was so beautifully expressed here in West Sonoma County with Morningstar and Wheelers. What can we learn from that time? What, we don't want to miss it and write it off. Or were these people just stupid utopian dreamers who, you know, didn't really know how to make a go of life and regular society, whatever that is? Or are these people who had something that we sh maybe were missing <laughs> doing it the conventional way, whatever that well, is? Well, all I know is when, when, I, when I look at an Amazon tribe, uh, they lie in their hammocks for a large part of the day playing with their kids. And maybe then in the cool of the evening, they'll go out and hoe the taro. And then uh, someone will go out and catch a fish for dinner. And all told, they probably work two hours a day. And the rest is fun. Now, who are the, who are the messed up primitives, I want to know? Are they, or are we, working nine to five to support a lifestyle that's polluting the planet and uh, not making us very happy, you know? There are two good films. Affluenza is a good one to watch. <laughs> and the other one is Return to, Return to Affluenza, or something like that, there's a sequel. But it gives you a, a good idea of what's happening to this culture. And uh, the hippies saw it and uh, tried to return to nature, to a more natural way of life, and in the process spawned off a whole bunch of things that have been grabbed onto by the major culture and in various ways transformed or corrupted or whatever you want to call it. But it has impacted the major culture in a whole bunch of ways and will continue to. And I think uh, as we go totally solar, totally you know, off the grid, in various ways, uh, people say, oh yeah, they really saw it coming. Wow, huh. Anyway, that's what I think. Jimmy. Yes, sir. You spent some time at Morningstar Ranch. I did that. That is like a designated hippie commune. That was Which what is. we would call it you know, today and <laughs> then as well, yeah, sure. Yeah, how was it? Uh, it Lou, it was an eye-opener experience for me in that it was like a, uh, uh, a microcosm of all the things that could have been in a large city, except it was there and you could put your hands on it and you weren't deluded by a whole bunch of that stuff going around and that all these personalities were individual. And so it got, gave you a chance to really like uh, study like people. And that was one of the things about Morning Star was very good for me in that it gave me an opportunity to look at 35 people on a regular basis and all kinds of experiences with them, you know, as such. 
maybe partly you weren't so distracted and occupied and preoccupied with yeah. the work and the corporate grind or, or well, whatever because you were there. Well, it wasn't a question of the corporate gr grind. I mean, well, there were times I left there to go to work, uh, but uh, but one of the things that was like paramount to me was uh, really I went to morning and started to become enlightened. And uh, it's hard to be enlightened when, when you have a, a mic, this gigantic uh, bond of things in front of you, you need to like limit yourself. And uh, then when you limit yourself, uh, you, you study these 35 people uh, and you saw their individual characteristics and traits. And then you know that this guy does this and that guy does that. And if you want to stay a, 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 like ahead of the game with this person, you don't compete with this person that way. And then you're finding Danny. There was a guy up there called Nevada. And one of the things that he did, and he got into fights all the time, was uh, uh, if, he th if you ever said you could do anything better than him, he was going to be drunk and get into a fight with you. So the idea is don't be, need to be better than someone at throwing knives or whatever. So we got along fine. And uh, but other people, yeah, oh, no, you can, I can, you know, mm. no, you can. I, then those were the people that he encountered, and those, yeah. the, that takes whatever that intelligent takes to do. I mean, you know, you need to. I that was the morning star. Was it gave me an opportunity to really explore characteristics in people. And that was the source of a lot of that of enlightenment. How you wanted to show up in the world and what you were gonna well, bring around you. First of all, you got to interpret. You, no one just no one gets enlightened. You know, you gotta be able to figure it out. And and, and lot, when initially when I went to Morningstar, even my friend Bob here, who was at Morningstar, uh, he, my girlfriend said, you know, that I, now I'm all this boisterous person. And uh, uh, she said to him, uh, he must, he probably talked a lot when he was at Morningstar. And Bob said, no, he didn't. <laughs> Yeah, you know, because I was observing. I was trying to consume all of this stuff, and. Uh, Maybe I reached the point where I'm starting to talk about it now, perhaps, but, uh, but, but it was all a learning process. I mean, I wanted to learn something, and it, wasn't, and it wasn't party. It wasn't that. I was not a party person. I was more the guru-oriented person and stuff like that. It was more that with me, and that's kind of how I'm to this day. Marion, it seems like you were really struck by the experience that you had at Wheeler Ranch for the time you were there that, that really was a profound impact it on really you. was it was I was never <laughs> never the same again yeah why is that what was what was it about that environment or that culture of that lifestyle that really just infected you this you way? know the first thing that comes to mind I was raised that you had to have your du your baseboards dusted you you know people would judge you if you had dust on your baseboards and I was living in a dome I was out on the knoll as well and we didn't have any baseboards. There were no baseboards to worry about dust. And I, it was terribly liberating. You know, it's like, sort of, fuck it to the whole thing, <laughs> which was really Yeah, it real. was freedom. It was. Yeah, it, and you were it was, liberated from Everything was questioned. Nothing was a given. You know, you wanted to run naked, so run naked. I stood, we, um, Olivia, Alicia, what's her name? Alicia Bay Laurel? That's what I'm trying there to say. Thank you. She would stand on her head in the sun because the underneath side of her boobs wasn't tanned. So so we would we would stand on her head in the sun so we would have a good all over tan. It was great. It was great. It was where I first learned to go naked. Yeah, because before that it was like, you can't do that. Yeah, don't show that body. Uh, that's that's yeah. not like the other animals that don't need clothing when we see them. No, it was it was great. The other thing that was a big deal for me. It, it seems incredible to me now, but it's actually true. I was 25 when I got there. I had a, an arm baby, mm -hmm. uh, my daughter, and um, it had never entered my head that I could manage my own life. It just simply had not occurred to me. I had gone straight from my father's house to my husband's house and I had met a man in California, it didn't occur to me. And I look back on that and it's like, really? It's like, actually, yeah. So what I learned at Wheeler's was that I could do everything I needed to do for myself except chop wood. And if I'd have been there another week, I'd have learned how to chop wood, <laughs> you know? And I could trade at dinner for chopping wood. 
So it was about independence. It was about living that I, learning that I could do my own, you know, and I, I heard the, the guy before me was talking about hitchhike, you know, going into uh, Occidental. Occidental was going into town. Sebastopol was the big city, you know, and, and Santa Rosa was like, oh, I got Sears, you know. Uh, <laughs> too, too much. Yeah, right, right, Too much right, real right, right, you know, this but, world. Oh, it was just life changing, you know, and, and the different parts of Wheelers, there was the big deep canyon on the east side, there was the knoll. I had a really sweet dome that was vacant when I got there and it was sort of oval shaped and it had a bed. It had a cast iron stove that some giant had brought in. And uh, I learned how to cook on a, on a wood stove. I learned how to wash clothes on a wood stove. It was just, I was never the same. Yeah, I, to this day, it was never the same. It really, it was like the scales fell off of my eyes. It's like, you don't need baseboards, hello. Yeah, so you really see them as, uh, well, visionaries and uh, people who had exceptional insight into mm what was what their heart connected with the natural right. world right. we've been so successfully separated from it and each other it's hard to you know for people to even acknowledge that we are nature that we are an animal i think walking creatures were invented by trees as portable portable fertilizer factories and if you don't take one sacramental shit in the ground at least one a year you're not fulfilling your life purpose and uh the minute you do, the trees will say, oh, there's a friend of ours. Wow, we're going to look out for him. He's doing what he was, meant, he was designed to do. But, uh, you know, that, that's just a, a funny story. But above and beyond that is the truth that we are uh, animals living on a planet, planet that we should be having a whole lot more respect for and love for than we have, you know. It's not just something we can cut up and, and uh, parcel out and make money on. It's something we should cherish and uh, the land should be something which we look at as our mother the way the Native Americans did and not think it's just, I mean, the Native Americans, when, when the white people came and said, hey, can I buy some of your land? They, they said, buy land. They, they, didn't know what, they laughed. They didn't even, I, I, the concept didn't make any sense to them. It's like saying, hey, can I, can I sleep with your mother? You know, something like just that. Just non sequitur. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, here we are, still talking about the homeless people, uh, of whom we had the perfect solution in our open land uh, communities, where anybody could come and build their own little cabin and live off the grid, uh, not with a very, very low polluting lifestyle. Of course, it was bringing the land prices down, horrors, shock. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were, we were doing the right thing. We were obviously doing the right thing. We were reverting to the type of life that the original inhabitants lived, and uh, that, that was that was all to the good. What can we learn from summer love times? We could use now. Uh, I, I don't know if you can actually. You know, it's like it was a good one of those great illusions almost like in regards to the history of today it was a, an illusion uh, uh, there are people that still think that way you know and that's what i you know i gravitate towards these things for that reason but i it's almost like the cat's out of the bag it's like in the fact that uh the scientists are saying that it's called two degrees uh if you get two degrees over the mean temperature new york's going to be underwater and, and the fact of the matter is no one seems to realize that that's what's happening out at this point these hurricanes that we're having all part of that whole situation is changing weather wise and uh, I used to work for Greenpeace and I, I used to, I learned too much I had to get away from there because I, I learned too much I used to come home with headaches about what the system and, and the general uh, populace that wasn't aware of the chemicals and all of this and literally I, just, I, get, I was inundated with this information and I, I couldn't do it anymore because it, it was created major headaches for me. What do you think about this 50th anniversary of Summer of Love? Is it a worthy opportunity to revisit some of the well, it's a concepts? Of, it's kind of a shock on one level. But on another level, if, it's, if it does awaken people or remind them 
to what actually occurred, then all right, let's go for it. But I don't know. A lot of it just sort of passed me by. Well, that's what we want to do here is yeah. use it as that impetus yeah. for yeah. Yeah. sharing this information. I mean, when I went around to the exhibits, there was very, very little about communes, even very little about urban communes. The only shot I saw of an urban commune was the Grateful Dead all lined up on their front steps. 710 Hay. Uh, and Ashbury, that was yeah. it, you know. But, uh, but uh, there was nothing on the rural communes. There was, there was little on the urban. The whole communal thing just wasn't bypassed. Well, let, let's give a quick pl plug, because you've just come out with this book, Home Free Home, about the communes. Yeah, well... It was, Why'd uh, you write it? What, did, what was so important to share? Well, it's pretty thick. It was a history of two open land communes where anybody could come and live. And I thought Wheeler Ranch especially, I thought was a, a, a learning where people from the city could come and find out how to live on the land. I um, mean, some people didn't even know how to grow a carrot, you know, and they had to find that out. And then we were like a gateway to the whole stretch of land that went up through Mendocino, uh, which got called the kingdom. Uh, what's the word I used? Well, anyway, it's a kingdom. And, uh, and people would get their chops and, and uh, suddenly take off and go up and find a cheap piece of land in Mendocino or somewhere higher, further north and set up their own scene. So I figured we were a learning experience for thousands of people who came through. And as I say, you know, of the six years Wheeler's was open, Bill only had to ask six people to leave. And if you compare that to the arrest for break-ins and other more serious offenses in Sonoma County, the, the average rate per year was 20 point something people. So that's five times the rate of, uh, of, of problems that we had on open land and anybody could come. So there must have been something good about it. We must have been doing something right. <laughs> yeah, so what, what are people missing that, that don't have these, ex this experience that you've had and this epiphany about the, the tra how trapped we are by the trappings of modern life? You know, I think what they're missing is most of it you just don't need, you know? I, I made a dress out of an army blanket. It was actually pretty cool, you know. Um, I could carry what I needed. I didn't need much money to live. I could cook on a stove. I, I already knew how to make a fire. I was pretty self-sufficient in that regard. And the idea that you'd bring your, tw bring your um, tinder and kindling in the house before the sun went down because in the morning when the sun came up, everything was damp. So I'd go out and I'd find a nice big branch with all the twigs and stuff, and I'd bring that in and put it on top of the wood box before the sun went down, and that way I had all my twigs and kindling ready for my morning fire. So, you know, and you'd have a morning fire and an evening fire, and you'd eat leftovers for lunch, you know, and we'd... One time I remember a bunch of people, there was a lot of people coming through some people came through and they had beer and pot, so we all joined them, of course, naturally. <laughs> and they had about a four foot long iguana. And so we're all sitting around in a circle and it's in the evening time and we got a fire going and everybody's having a good time. And here comes this little half grown kitten and it's stalking the iguana. And so we, <laughs> We warned the owners of the iguana. They said, don't worry about it. The iguana can take care of himself. So the kitten continued to stalk. And he got up within range and the iguana goes Whoo! with his tail. It made a sound like a cable going through the air. And the kitten comes down four feet over there running. <laughs> and the iguana just. He was right. Yeah. The iguana <laughs> don't worry himself. about the iguana. It's always cool. Well, it's yeah. great. It, you know, it's so easy to separate and forget that we are nature. It's a part of it. We are literally nature, and it's the same thing, right? At the end I of the day, we do what we got to do to... I think my son was conceived at Wheeler's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so truly life-changing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Life-creating. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there was a lot of paranoia. You know, one day there was supposed to be some kind of authorities coming in, and there was a guy who was, I think he was AWOL from the Army, and he didn't want to talk to anybody. So we all went down in the um, East Canyon, which was a long ways down. And we we're sitting down there. We were making sand candles to pass the time. And here come two guys walking up the creek in fatigues. And we're going, oh, no. 
And turned out they were on leave from the army. They were friendly guys and they had tie stick and we all got so stoned. We couldn't even, I, you know, I think we all went to sleep for about two hours. But um, it was all cool, no problem. It was all cool. It was all cool. No problem. Mm -mm. Was there a racial element that you experienced there? What, what was the, the vibe on that front? San Francisco in the 60s, uh, there was a major black guy they used to call Super Spade, and somehow or another, he got killed, uh, but he was like the, like the force in San Francisco for a lot of underground activities, drugs and stuff of that nature. And uh, when he died, uh, like all of San Francisco kind of wept over that fact because he was a nice guy and yet, you know, he was, you know, killed. Uh, I personally, I, I come from a different kind of experience racially wise. I didn't have any really close back friends until I was in my 20s. And I kind of grew up in, a, uh, my father was in business, so I, I, did, I did things that were not atypically black. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Oh my God! I don't know this voice. It's someone wrote a screenplay about my life, you know, and oh, that really? and that it's about this black guy that uh, d basically uh, did everything contradictory to the, the the general norm expected him to do, not on purpose. Just that he's just not open in the beginning, and that's that openness in the beginning is what led me to be a hippie. And uh, so, but. Being a hippie in the 60s, you know, I mean, they referred to blacks as spades. That was a, not a negative thing, that, you know, and that was totally acceptable. I, I, I never really encountered any negativity in, in being a hippie, a black hippie in the 60s. Uh, I, and I just never, it never, you know, everyone was like, you know, I, I wish it was that way today, unfortunately. I don't feel that it is. Maybe I'm jaded, but nevertheless. Uh, I felt no racial animosity in the 60s towards me whatsoever. So you think it's it's growing in intensity and you feel a, a growing intensity? Oh, I do. Area. Yeah. I mean, in regards to the racism yeah, of today, oh, it's really, yeah, yeah it's, it's messed up. It's really, really messed up. Uh, you know, the d door was opened by our, few, our president to some extent. Yeah. And, uh, but because he just basically didn't say what he should have did in the order which he did in regards to like David Duke. He uh, didn't denounce David Duke for about a couple of weeks after he, David Duke endorsed him, which, which gave those people who came out of the woodwork to vote for him to say, oh, he's our man because yeah. he didn't denounce David Duke. And so, and so the world is really, especially the United States, I mean, I, I think racism based upon our new president is on the rise. Wow, what can I say? We just appreciate the opportunity to sit and hear your perspective on things. Thank you. And since uh, you've put things in a little bit different light than we've really heard before, and it, it's, oh. a, it's a complimentary light to the times mm -hmm. and the, the, the spirit of the people who were yearning for something different and felt that something just wasn't quite right in our world, the way we were operating. Well, let's end with a paraphrase from a writer. Uh, oxygen, uh, uh, Hydrogen, given enough time, will turn into hippies. Any solutions for any of this, or are we just on the path to doom? I think we're on the path to doom. I hate to be, a, I hate to say that, honestly, Julie, well, because I see people and, and I like people, but 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 it's it's individuals is one thing, and society is another. I mean, individuals. Are, but, but we let people to, to do our fuck-ups for us, and they really are fucking up for us. They're doing a great job, right? They're, <laughs> They're doing us. a good job, right? Yeah. And, and it's gotten away from, you know, that, that brother thing, other than among my, my peers. Mm -hmm. I feel personally, and I mean, the young kids today are, are certainly more intuitive, and they got more stuff to, 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 to look through to, to come to those right conclusions. But there's so much out there. Are you going to ever come to that conclusion? You know, because you got so much to look through. Well, if we're all going down, brother, I guess well, all we could do <laughs> is hold on to each other, right? Well, so we yeah. wrap with a hug. I no problem with that. <laughs> Well, much gratitude to you for putting your heart in this whole thing and yes. making that happen and showing 2,500 people <laughs> something they, they might not have realized was going on. It was on. a labor of love. Yeah, that's good. Glad you did it. Oh, and how. Yeah. And, but I was sad when it ended. I said, we can't just let it go. We've got to have a reunion. <laughs> so this is going to be the last chance for a lot of these 
old hippies to get together. Yeah. Well, we're happy to be a part of it. We thank you for that, too. Well, thank you for being such an important part. You'll be so excited to learn that we uh, love to wrap our interviews with hugs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely, lovely. Oh, cool. Do you miss it? I think I'm going to say no. I'm you did it. Have it but I'm place. still in Sonoma County. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really go very far. This is the place to be. And I love going out Coleman Valley Road. I just love because my, I walked in moccasins when I was out there and out of my feet grew these deep roots right directly through the moccasins that went straight into Sonoma County. And yeah, my, my heart has never left. So in some ways I'm still there. So yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was definitely life-changing, absolutely life-changing. Woo! I don't need someone else to run my life. I can run my own life. What a concept. And I think back, it's like, really? It's like, really? You know, the women's movement was just getting started in those days. Whew, goodness gracious, yeah. So yeah, it was the um, first time I ever saw California. What a way to see it. What a welcome. Yeah, it was awesome. It was, I missed the summer of love, but by golly, I, I didn't miss Wheelers. I'm really grateful I had that. Yeah. Wonderful. Wrap with a hug. Oh.